Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you are awesome. You are awesome. You are so awesome. And Lord, sometimes it feels like words on a page, but Lord, you are great. You are mighty. What we could never do for ourselves, you have done for us. And Lord, I pray that you would help us to see that this morning. By your spirit, Lord, you would anoint this time. We thank you, Lord. We give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thanks. Thanks, guys. Sorry for the curveball. Um, Easter, why does, why does Easter matter? Why is Easter so important? Um, why uh, does this time of the year matter? Some of us, maybe, uh, the answer is quite obvious, right? The, uh, Easter matters because it's an extra long weekend, right? Friday off, Monday off. You know, lots of extra time to do whatever it is we, we want to do. Um, for some of us, uh, maybe our teachers and our students among us, it's a, it's a break, right? A break from the rigors of school, just a time to just relax uh, before going back into school. You know, depending on what kind of school you attend, that might be an awful thing or, or a good thing, but it's a break. Uh, for most of us, I imagine that the reason why Easter matters is because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Um, and I want us to see why that's so important. Um, the, the resurrection of Jesus Christ is so important because it is a picture of the eternity that God has promised for us. And that's why Easter matters. That's why the resurrection matters. Uh, we saw it in the reading when the book of Isaiah, Isaiah was a prophet who lived about 700 years before Jesus. And specifically, we're in Isaiah 25, which is part of a section in the book of Isaiah, 24 to 27, that's all about this end time vision of what things will look like in the end. And very briefly, what we're going to see in this vision, the vision of Isaiah 25, is that there was a great feast, there was a great defeat, and there was a great reversal. There was a great feast, there was a great defeat, and there was a great reversal. And so we're going to actually start with the great feast and the great defeat. And that's actually in the middle of the chapter. That's where we're going to start. And then we're going to end with the great reversal, which kind of frames the chapter at the beginning, at the end. And the point of all of this is that we might see how great God is. How the resurrection tells us about how great God is. Firstly, then, in this chapter, what we see, this vision... What we see is a great feast. So look at me right there in the middle, verse 6. On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wine, of rich food full of marrow, of aged wine well refined. Isaiah here gives us a picture of the end, the end, the, 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 the final day, and what he sees is a feast, a banquet, right? And it's a great feast. It's a great feast. The, the reason you know it's a great feast is because there is a great menu. The, the menu at this feast is telling you something about how great this feast is. This feast is better than, you know, the three Michelin-style restaurant that you want to go to. Um, the food is better. The portions are bigger. This feast is incredible, Right? You see that from the menu. Firstly, let's, let's look at the food menu. The, the, the Bible says there's rich food. The, the word here, more literally, is that they're fat things. That's the word, fat things. It's talking about meat. Right? So the first thing about this feast is that there is meat. And look, that's amazing. No shade to our vegetarian and vegan brothers and sisters. I love you all. But that's amazing. There's meat here. In the ancient world, meat was a, real, was a rare thing. You didn't eat meat all the time. It was a rare thing to eat meat. Well, here, in this feast, the feast on the final day, the final day that God has promised, there is meat. And not just meat, as I said before, it's the fat of the meat. Now, I know some of us, you know, we're staying away from that. We're looking for all the lean meat. Um, but in the ancient world, again, the fat of the meat was the best part. That, that was the best part. That was the part you looked forward to. 
You know, no one cut off the fat and just left it to the side. No, in the ancient world, that was the thing you looked forward to. Uh, the Bible talks about the, the fattened calf, you know, the calf that's been fattened, lots of fat there. That's, that, that's good stuff. It may not sound appetizing to you, but it is. It, it's great. It's fantastic. Uh, you know it's the good stuff because in the sacrificial system, the fat was the part that even the priest could not eat. The fat belonged to the Lord. It had to be burnt up. It was the best part that was reserved for God himself. And yet here what we see is that the Lord is hosting a feast. And at this feast, there is meat and not just meat. There is fat meat, but not just fattened meat. There is, the meat is full of marrow. So there is juicy, fatty meat. And I know for some of you that sounds like the, your, the worst idea. But get with me into the world of Isaiah. This is incredible. The food menu is incredible. So that's the food. And then we turn to the drinks. And on the drinks menu, what we see is that the Bible tells us that there is well-aged wine. Now, I am not, an, I'm not a wine expert by any stretch of the imagination. Um, but I know from watching films and watching TV shows that the older the wine, the better. That wine gets better over time. The Bible says it's not just any wine, it's well-aged wine. This is that 1642 bottle of wine, right, or whatever year it is. It's been kept. It's, it's been getting better, however it does. It's been fermenting, whatever it is that wine does. But it's been getting better. This wine isn't just any ordinary wine. This is the best of the best wine. The, the meat is the best. The food is the best. The wine is the best. The promise of the new creation is that the Lord, the God Almighty, is hosting a feast, and this feast will be great. And this is one of the great pictures of the end. It's one of the great pictures of the end. It's this reminder that at the end, God is going to be with his people once again. That actually, the division that exists between us and God, that's not the way the world is meant to be. That's not how God created the world. God's design for the world is that we would be with him. We would be one with him. We would sit with him. We would commune with him. And the ultimate picture of that is that we will eat with him. We will gather around the table and we will actually eat with him. We will commune with him. We will feast together on the same table as the almighty God. This is the picture that all of our hearts are yearning for, looking for. All of our desires are pointing to that, that we might be with the God who made us and we might eat with him. There is a God who made us who wants to eat with us. There's a God who has made us who has prepared a table for us. And he's waiting for us. That's the great promise of Isaiah 25. That God, right now, he's preparing the meat. The meat is in the slow cooker. The very, very, very slow cooker. It's cooking. The, the wine is fermenting. Because the almighty God wants to be with us. And on the day when he brings us to himself, there will be a great feast. There will be a great feast. Now you might be wondering, okay, there's a great feast. What's that got to do with Easter? What's that got to do with the resurrection? Well, the great feast exists because on that day when we are united with God, we will be celebrating a great defeat. And the great defeat is the defeat of death. Verse 7. And he will swallow up on this mountain the covering that is cast over all peoples, the veil that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death forever. And the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces, and the reproach of his people he will take away from all the earth, for the Lord has spoken. Isaiah speaks of death. He says it's the covering that covers all people. What, what an amazing description of death. It's like a thick covering that covers everything. It's like a covering that blots out the light. Uh, on Friday, Mike was talking about darkness. Death is that ultimate darkness. It spoils everything. It ruins everything. It clouds everything. Death puts a full stop to everything. Everything that lives must die. Death is universal. The, as I said, it's the covering that covers all peoples. Death is undefeated. No matter how young, young you are, no matter how rich you are, no matter how smart you are, no matter how accomplished you are, every day, every single day you live, you are moving closer to the day of your death. 
You could look back in history and you will see no person, no matter how great, no matter how wise, no matter how smart they were, no matter how great their philosophy was, not one of them escaped death. Right? So you can read of them, and what you will read for every single person that's lived is, and then they died. Because no one escapes from death. Death is undefeated. That's true for us. Every single one of us here in this room, we will die. The, the day of our death is approaching. Death is this great tragedy, this great cloud that covers everything. You know, every single one of us, you, you will either live, you either live long enough, and this is the tragedy of death, you either live long enough to see every single person that you love die, or they will see you die. Every single loved person you have, that's the reality, right? That's how cruel death is. The reality is that either you will see them die or they will see you die. There's no chance of another possibility. That's the cruelness of death. That's the great covering of death. It covers all peoples and it covers them with darkness. I was looking at this text. I, I, you can't escape here at church, Stockwell Baptist Church. I feel like we felt that more and more. It feels like we're losing more and more people. Our family members, people we love, have passed away. Death is this great covering and it covers all peoples. And yet the good news, the good news that is celebrated at this feast is that God has promised that he would defeat death. God has promised he would defeat death. That's what people are celebrating at this feast. And if you want to know, you're reading Isaiah 25, and you want to know, how is it that God will defeat death? I actually think the language in Isaiah gives us a clue. This is one of those things, you know, you read the Bible, and the Bible's amazing because you see new things all the time. It's one of the things that I hadn't noticed before. The Bible doesn't just say that God will destroy death. The language is more specific. Verse 7, verse 8, the Bible says God will swallow death. God will swallow death. That's amazing. That's striking. God will defeat death, but the way he will defeat death is by swallowing it. Right? He's going to swallow death. In other words, the way he's going to defeat death isn't just by giving some kind of external attack. No, somehow God will defeat death by taking death into himself. God is going to swallow it. He's going to take it. That's how he's going to destroy death. In other words, way back in Isaiah 25, Isaiah is already telling us something about the good news of the gospel. That the way God will defeat death is by taking on death himself. The way he would defeat death is that the son of God would come and live and die. And in his death, he will swallow up death. He will take death into himself. Right? He destroys death by dying. That's what we're talking about on Good Friday. That the son of God died. He really died. He took in death. He swallows up death. You know, that's one reason why Saturday matters. You know, the Saturday we don't ever talk about between Good Friday and Easter Sunday. The Saturday matters. The Saturday tells us that Jesus died. There was a time where Jesus was dead. He, he took on death. He really, really, really did die. He, it's not a, a thing where he dies for a few minutes and gets back up. No, there was a time where Jesus' body lies cold in a tomb. God swallows up death. And yet here is the defeat. The defeat isn't just Good Friday. It's not just that Jesus died. The defeat of death is found on Easter Sunday because Jesus rose. And in his rising from the dead, he defeats death itself. The defeat is that early, early on that Sunday morning, the heart of Jesus of Nazareth, which had stopped beating, at one point began to beat again. The lungs, which were just flat, they got inflated again. His skin that was cold began to get warm again. Jesus, who was dead, now is alive. He rose from the dead. He, take, he took on death and he defeated death. He swallows death and he overcomes death. And this is unique. It's unique because death has been delayed before. 
we read in the Bible of resurrections before. But those resurrections are just a delay. If you read the book of Kings, you see there's two boys who died and yet were raised to life. And yet what we realize is that those boys died again. It's like they got a rematch with death, but they lost the rematch. Jairus' daughter in the Gospels is raised, but then she dies again. Lazarus had been dead for four days. Jesus spoke, Lazarus came to life, but guess what? Lazarus died again. And yet, there is a resurrection that was utterly unlike any other resurrection. There is a day when death met an opponent unlike any other opponent he had faced before. Because on that day, on Easter Sunday, that first Easter Sunday, death was not delayed. Death was defeated. On the very first Easter Sunday, Jesus Christ got up from the grave never to die again. Never to die again. Look, over this period, the last few years, with the pandemic and stuff, we've had lots of chats about, you know, vaccines. And I'm not here to get into any of the vaccine stuff, you know, whatever our views are on that. But the main idea is this. Most of us get what vaccines are meant to do. The idea behind the vaccine is that you take some bit of a disease or something that's deadly and you put it inside you. And the idea is that by doing that, you gain these antibodies, which learn to fight it. And so when you actually encounter the disease itself, you're immune from that disease. That's the way vaccines are meant to work. Jesus doesn't take a bit of death. Jesus swallows up death. He takes death in its full force. And because he rose again on that Easter Sunday, he is now forever immune from death. Death has no dominion over him. And the good news of Easter is that that immunity he shares with those who trust in him. That is that those who trust in him, though they die, they will not die. Right? Though they die, they won't actually face the sting of death. Though they die, their death will be a pathway to life. Though they die, it will just be the beginning of eternal life. Jesus shares that immunity with us because in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, death has been defeated. And as part of that defeat of death, part of that is a package deal. The Bible says here that he will wipe away every tear from our eyes. And he will do away with our reproach, our shame. Verse 8, right? Did you notice that? Verse 8, he will wipe away every tear from our eyes and he will take away our shame. And so I wonder this morning, as I stand before you guys, what is causing your tears? Um, Where is your grief? Uh, I'm your pastor, I know some, I know bits. Um, I know only bits of your grief. I know we, we gather here together and we, we come and we greet one another and we sing together, but we gather as people whose lives are also marked by grief, right? Um, some of us are, are grieving loved ones, lost loved ones. Um, and so maybe it feels like everyone else has moved on with their life and it feels like you are still stuck in that place you were when you first heard the news that the person you loved had lost their life. Uh, Some of us are grieving the reality of old age. Um, You're getting older and you realize that your body doesn't work the same, right? Um, Your body's given up on you, it's betraying you. Things you used to be able to do without pain are now super painful. Things you never used to even, you could do it without thinking and now Every bit of it is marked by excruciating pain. Some of us, our minds seem to be giving way. Um, Our minds aren't working the way they used to. Some of us are grieving because we have lost dreams and lost desires. It feels like God has been cruel to you because God knows how much you want these things and yet God has not given it to you. Some of us are grieving because we have lost relationships Relationships that were meant to be marked by love and joy have been so twisted by sin. And it's, it's just full of brokenness and bitterness and pain, right? Some of us, maybe it's shame. 
shame is one of the most powerful human emotions there is. For very early on as kids, we learn what shame feels like and we spend the rest of our life trying to avoid feeling like that. Maybe we feel shame because life hasn't worked out the way we thought it would or we've not met the expectations of other people. Look, regardless of what it is, I, I'm not here to just em- offer you some empty platitudes. I'm not here to simply just tell you, just you know, it's just going to get better, or you know, it could be worse, or to look on the bright side of life. I'm I'm not here to tell you that. Um, what I am here to say, what Isaiah 25 tells us, is that because Jesus Christ, the Son of God, rose from the dead, the day is coming where God will wipe every tear from your eyes. And the day is coming where God will remove any shame that you have in your life. Your pain has an expiration date. Your shame has an expiration date. Your grief is not eternal, right? The the suffering you are experiencing will not last. It will not last forever. In fact, it will be but a short time. It will be but a short time. Evil, in fact, has lost. Darkness has lost. Death has lost. God has won. Right? God has won. Cancer has lost. Diabetes has lost. Old age has lost. Heart attacks have lost. Depression has lost. Disappointment has lost. I'm not telling you just just keep going, things will get better. What I am telling you is the day is coming when all of that will be wiped away. Because Jesus, the Son of God, rose from the dead. I'm not telling you to hope, just have some random hope. I'm telling you because 2,000 years ago, Jesus got up. Because that is true, already now you can know that the day is coming where every tear will be wiped from your eyes. See that phrase, that God will wipe every tear from your eyes. You, you might recognize that from Revelation. It's a, it's a picture of what will happen in the new heavens and the new earth, the new creation. Let me tell you, the new creation began 2,000 years ago when Jesus rose from the dead. Already we live in the new creation. Already we can be sure of the new creation. Jesus rose from the dead. And what that means, what that means, church, is that our pain is temporary. Our pain will not last. Because we are headed to the new creation and it started in the resurrection. That's the great feast. The great feast and the great defeat. And part of that On that day, there will be a great feast celebrating a great defeat. And God will bring about a great reversal. This is how the passage begins and ends. So firstly, look at me at how the passage begins. Oh Lord, you are my God. Verse 1. I will exalt you. I will praise your name. For you have done wonderful things, planned, formed of old, faithful and sure. For you have made the city a heap, the fortified city a ruin. The foreigner's palace is a city no more. It will never be rebuilt. Therefore, strong peoples will glorify you. Cities of ruthless nations will fear you. For you have been a stronghold to the poor, a stronghold to the needy in his distress, a shelter from the storm and a shade from the heat. For the breath of the ruthless is like a storm against a wall, like heat in a dry place. You subdue the noise of the foreigners as heat by the shade of a cloud, so that the song of the ruthless is put down. On that day, the final day, God will bring about a great reversal. On that day of the great feast, when God defeats death and wipes every tear from our eyes, there will be a great reversal. In other words, on that table, you won't see the people that have been great in this life, who you might expect to be on that table, you won't see. And the people that seem to have nothing in this life, that you wouldn't expect to be on the table, those are the people you will see. God is going to flip the world upside down. God is going to turn things upside down. Do you notice that verse 4, God is a stronghold to the poor, a stronghold to the needy, a shelter from the storm, a shade from the heat. God gives strength to those who do not have strength. And the opposite issue, verse 2, God will bring the city, he will turn it into a heap, the fortified city into a ruin, the palace he will devastate. The song of the ruthless he will cause to be put down. God is going to bring about a great reversal. Those who have nothing will find themselves having everything. Those who have everything will find themselves having nothing. And look, if you're you're familiar with the story of the Bible, you know that this is what God loves to do. He loves these reversals. 
He loved to take a slave people who were, had nothing with no military power and he loved to, to take them and rescue them by his own great power. And yet that great military power that was Egypt, he devastated with plagues and drowned them in the Red Sea. He loves that. He's the same God who took a man called Gideon and 300 men and used them to defeat 135,000 strong Midianite warriors. Right? He's the God we read of in Matthew who sends away the wise and the powerful and the strong. He sends them away but delights to reveal the secrets of the kingdom to the weak and the needy. On that day, there will be this great reversal. Our world today is marked by survival of the fittest, right? The best, the smartest, the strongest, the richest, they do the best. But the day is coming, the day of the great feast is coming. And on that day, there will be a great reversal. Our God will flip this world upside down. So what does that mean? What does that mean? What does it mean, ultimately, that there is a great feast? What does it mean that there is this great defeat? What does it mean that part of that will be this great reversal? Well, look with me at the end, because the end is, again, speaking about this great reversal, but it tells us how we are to respond. Verse 9, it will be said on that day, behold, this was our God, we have waited for him, that he might save us. This is the Lord, we have waited for him. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. For the hand of the Lord will rest on this mountain, and Moab shall be trampled down in his place, as straw is trampled down in a dung hill. And he will spread out his hands in the midst of it, as a swimmer spreads his hands out to swim. But the Lord will lay low his pompous pride together with the skill of his hands. Look, one thing here for those of us here who are not yet trusting in Jesus Christ, and, and I'm grateful you're here, and then I'm going to say two things for those of us who are trusting in Jesus Christ. Firstly, for those of us who are here, who are not trusting in Jesus Christ, who are joining us, this is a call to repentance. The way this passage, chapter, ends, it reminds us that Easter is not just some generic good news. It's not just about a new start for all people. It's not just a message of hope, just generically out there. It is unbelievably good news. It is about a new start but it's specifically for those who have trusted in Jesus Christ. It's for those who have trusted in God. It is not good news for those who are self-sufficient. It is not good news for the proud. It is not good news for those who think they are okay in themselves. The warning here is that God will lay low the pompous pride of Moab. That's another way of saying that those who refuse to join God's people, those who think they have strength in themselves, will find themselves on the wrong side of the great reversal. They will find themselves facing judgment. Those who are like a fortified city, strong in yourself, will find yourself to be a ruin on that day. Those who are self-made will find themselves undone. And I'm saying that because if you are here and you're not trusting in Jesus Christ, it must be because in one sense you are trusting yourself. It must be because you think you have it in you to make it through life. It must be because there is something about your skills or your abilities that makes you think that you do not need God. Maybe you think, I'm, I'm just lucky. I'm just one of those guys. I'm lucky. I can do it by myself. Um, I don't know what reason you might have to put confidence in yourself. But I can tell you this. On the day when you face death, you will have no chance of defeating it. You have no hope against death. You have nothing by yourself that will give you any confidence beyond the day when you breathe your last. No matter how great your achievements are, no matter how wonderful your community is, none of that will matter on the day that you die. I do funerals. I I've done a number of funerals. One day, people will stand around you, your body. You have no way, no hope in that day by yourself. You need to put your faith in Jesus Christ. 
Your only hope is in Jesus Christ. Your only hope is in the one who swallowed up death on Good Friday and defeated it on Easter Sunday. Your only hope is the hope of eternal life. Do not spend this life trying to live for now, trying to amass things. You're looking for the next thing. You're looking to the next holiday. You're looking to retirement. To what end? To what end? The day of death is coming. To what end? All, all the things you're looking for, all the things you're living for, to what end? Put your faith in Jesus Christ. You do not know the day in which you will die. And wisdom, wisdom looks like trusting in Jesus Christ. Putting your faith in him. Recognizing you have nothing apart from him. Recognize you don't bring anything to the table because it's those who are weak and helpless that will be seated around God's great throne and on his great table, eating and feasting with him. Put your faith in Jesus Christ. For those of us who are trusting in Jesus this Sunday morning, this passage is trying to tell us, I think, ultimately two things. The first is this, wait. Wait on God. Wait for God. Verse 9 says, we have waited for God and he has saved us. Wait for God. You know, if you're saved, we were saved in hope. We are saved in hope because God has called us to wait. Your life might not seem like much right now, but God has called you to wait. You might be burdened with sorrow right now. God is calling you to wait. Jesus may not seem worth it right now. God is calling you to wait. And you can wait because our God is faithful. Our God has never made a promise he did not keep. And the promise is that if you wait on him, if you trust in him, if you continue to serve him, on that day, that day, he will wipe away every tear from your eyes. There are so many things out there that are promising us instant results, that promise us security, that promise us joy. There's so many things that it seems we do not have to wait for. All of those things are empty. All of those things are vain. Wait on God. Wait for God. Trust in God. My brother, my sister, wait on God. Don't give up on God. And as you wait on God, God will renew your strength. As you wait on God, God will give you the strength to continue to trust in him. God will not fail you. He will not fail you. God has promised you an incredible eternity. God has said, eyes have not seen, ears have not heard what God has in store for those that love him. That's what God has said. God is not a liar. He does not lie. Wait on him. Trust him. Wait, wait, wait. And you know that because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You know that because our Savior right now is in heaven and his eye is on you and he's waiting to bring you to himself to a world full of joy. You know that because he swallowed up death in victory and he's promised he will wipe every tear from your eyes. That is his promise. Wait on him. Wait on him. And secondly, as you wait on him, rejoice in him. Verse 9, let us rejoice and be glad. So in the midst of our waiting, in the midst of our sorrows, church, let's rejoice. Let's be a rejoicing people. Let's rejoice, rejoice, rejoice because Jesus has won the victory. Rejoice because Jesus has swallowed up death and yet death could not hold him down. Rejoice because Jesus Christ is the risen king. Rejoice, let's rejoice, like praise him, praise him because he burst out of the grave. On Easter Sunday, praise him because death is he's beneath him. He's beneath his feet. Praise him because he is risen from the dead and he is Lord. Praise him because our God is awesome. Praise him because the day is coming where he will wipe away the tears from our eyes. Praise him because he's about to remove the shame from us. Praise him in anticipation of the day when we stand on that mountain. Mount Zion, and we feast with him for all eternity. Praise him in anticipation of that day when surrounded by the angels, all the earth will shout his praise. All the earth will sing about how great our God is. Praise him because the end is assured. The end is written. Jesus has won. Jesus is risen. Praise him because we cannot tell it all. I cannot tell it all. What God has done for us, I cannot tell it all. For all eternity, I will not tell it all because Jesus Christ has won. He's won. So let's rejoice. 
no matter how deep our sorrow is, let's rejoice. There is a joy that it goes down to the depths of our sorrow. Let's rejoice because Jesus Christ has won. He's won. He's won. He's won. He's defeated death. He's defeated sorrow. He has won. And because he's won, we can rejoice. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you. We thank you for your son, Jesus Christ. Oh, God, you are so awesome. Awesome, God, how great you are. How great you are. How great you are. Lord, you've overcome death. And you have promised us that we will eat with you for all eternity. And you have promised that you will wipe every tear from our eyes. And you have promised us that you will take away our shame. Oh, Lord, give us faith to believe that. Give us faith to believe that. Give us faith to believe that. We ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.